Welcome once again to the Kim Justice channel. Famous and renowned by several people for uncovering all kinds of curios, mostly from the world of microcomputers. And today's no different, because I fancy having a look at some ports, either from the arcade or from consoles, but all of today's games aren't exactly well known or infamous. But most of them are kinda terrible, some of them beyond reason. It's a good excuse to cover a couple of things I've been sitting on for ages, hunting for a good excuse to stick them in a vit. And so we have 9 mostly unknown but definitely rubbish computer ports today. Just to offset things however, we also have one obscure port of a game that a lot of people don't think made it home at all, that's actually pretty good. So let's get started with that. If you were in the arcades in the early 90s, well, you surely know and loved this. The Simpsons, one of the absolute best arcade beat-em-ups ever. It hit right at the time when Simpsons Mania kicked in, featured all the show's characters at the time, it was a big old 4 player cab and it was an absolute riot. For me this is Konami's best arcade beat em up. A lot of people regret that somehow this massive hit of a game never got any home conversions. But actually, it did. It got two, and both were on computers made by Novatrade. There's an MS-DOS version of the game that, from the people who've played it at least, doesn't seem to get much praise, but we're not here for that version. We're here for the Simpsons arcade game on the Commodore 64. This port is very curious indeed. Its very existence makes me wonder why there weren't any other ports at all, just this and DOS, and no efforts on consoles. Was there some sort of licensing issue? <laughs> Maybe. But what's even more curious is that despite being a port of a then quite modern arcade game on by that point a very underpowered and old machine, it's really good. An excellent effort. This C64 port of the Simpsons game goes above and beyond to fit as much in as it can. It misses no levels, it has two player support, it doesn't screw up the controls, the enemies are there and there's often way more than just two of them on screen. Hell there's even an attempt at most of the game's cutscenes. The C64 port actually has a great deal more content than the aforementioned DOS version. And for a beat em up on the system, it plays very nice, better than many other attempts. And there's even really cool SID versions of the game's music. Novatrade, I suppose, they just went for it with this game's port on the C64, which is unexpected considering that their DOS port of the game is kinda half assed. More than anything else, I think this port is a real credit to the world's best selling home computer. When this was released in 1992, the C64 was a decade old, and it was still being used to make banners like this that really pushed the system. For the platform it's on, this port, frankly, is outstanding, and it's a shame that so few people know it. So yes, the Simpsons arcade did make it to the home, just really not in a way that you would expect. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the one good game that we'll be seeing in this video. Now it's time for a load of games that perhaps should have stayed forgotten. It seems right that after such a good version of a beat em up, we switch to an awful version of one. And so here's Double Dragon, a game that's ports are a mixed bag. On consoles it's generally satisfying if kinda different depending on what system you had, but on computers? generally they got shafted. This is the version that I mostly played when I was a young kid, Double Dragon on the Spectrum, and it's as miserable and dull an experience as it looks. If you think that's bad just because the system's underpowered, well here's the Amiga Double Dragon, and guess what? It's just as rubbish. Melbourne House did all of these, and they utterly stunk, but they saved the absolute worst for the poor old Commodore 64. Some group called Binary Design handled DD for the 64, and well there's some things you might look forward to in a C64 version of Double Dragon isn't there? A generally smoother experience than you'd get on the other micros perhaps? Or awesome SID renditions of the game's fantastic music? Well you get none of these things. What you get is an utter joke of an excuse for a beat em up. The action consists of nothing but getting close in and hammering buttons, taking or giving hits basically at random. 
Getting a weapon kinda helps, but not that much. It's dreadful. And no, there is no music outside the title screen, just some generic sound effects. Aside from that, the action plays out in complete silence. May as well be in a frickin' library. Aside from the gameplay being awful low, everything about this is shoddy beyond belief. Take a look at the sprites here. Notice that there's a massive gap between their upper and lower halves. That's the level we're at here. It's shocking. There isn't even a bigger bobo to crash through any walls, which is basically like having a Beatles only without a John Lennon. This port of Double Dragon is so shit, there's a note in the game's manual that essentially apologises for the hideous low quality of it. It's so bad, Ocean Software, of all people, released a second version of Double Dragon on the C64 in 1991, presumably to write some sort of Ron. And it is a better version, although it's still kinda garbage. They couldn't even be bothered to include the final boss fight. If you were a Double Dragon fan, but you only had a micro to hand, you were SOL especially if you had the Commodore 64. Still in the mood for punching and kicking fins? Well, here's another game for your consideration. Street Fighter. Now, I wasn't sure if there was much else to look at here. We've already had the rubbish micro versions of Street Fighter 2, including the ZX Spectrum one. But this is the original game. You know, the weird arcade with the big old button that you hit violently and thus was guaranteed to be completely broken as a result. Honestly, not a good game. And most people know it wasn't any good on the computers either. The Micros had a rubbish port handled by a tier text that, just to add insult to injury, they used for an even worse fighting game of their own called The Human Killing Machine. Again though, we're not here for that. We're here for a very special version of the original Street Fighter that can be found in the land of MS-DOS and wasn't handled by a tier text. Although after playing it, you'll probably wish it had been. So how come this wasn't handled by tier techs? Well, there's actually two micro versions of Street Fighter. A UK one, the tier Tech port, which we know and hate, and a US one. This is the US one, and it's also available on the C64, where it isn't actually that bad. It doesn't look good, but it's a lot faster than tier Tech's game. On DOS though? Good lord. The incredibly small sprites are what stands out straight away, I suppose. It's certainly not a looker. But gameplay-wise, this is broken. I have the greatest trouble even hitting any of these bloody enemies. It appears to be close to impossible. Knowing special moves doesn't seem to help much. Looking at other people's footage, it appears that half the time Ryu's Hadouken simply goes through enemies because the collision detection is balked. So what we have here is horrendous presentation, complete with PC speaker noise, unbelievably awful gameplay, and I believe that even if you were to somehow make it through the whole thing, there isn't even a Sagat to fight at the end. The game finishes with Adon. A very bad attempt at a port indeed. Ah, Mike Tyson's Punch-Out. It's not exactly new to point this out, but what a game it is. A perfectly presented, beautifully done mix of boxing and puzzling. We almost forget that it's an arcade port, to be honest, of this rather early Nintendo game from 1984, the one with two monitors and a wireframe boxer. The NES game is so good, it's kinda managed to drive this game out of existence in people's minds. But what about the other way? What happens when you really do punch out dirty and do it wrong? People might think of that awful Beam Software game starring Mike Tyson where he punches aliens, but I have another port of the original Punch-Out itself for consideration. Sort of. It's not necessarily one, but certainly odd. Here's Frank Bruno's Boxing. This appeared on the microcomputers, but here we're going to concentrate on the ZX Spectrum. This is basically an unofficial port of Punch-Out. Or, you know, a rip-off, if you want to be more direct about it. Here the almighty little Mac gets replaced with Britain's Len top heavyweight boxer, Frank Bruno who, to be fair, is just as lovable as Little Mac. It even rips off several of Punch-Out's rival boxers, with Bear Smasher, Dragon Chan and Vodka Drunkensky all making unofficial appearances with changed names. And no, Elite didn't get rights from Nintendo for any of this. Presumably the Big N would have sued if they'd been aware, but, well, you could fly under the radar easier in the 1980s. This is an intriguing affair. 
I have to admit I can't really figure out how to even play it because the controls are just so weird and convoluted and, well, this just seems like such a reach on the spectrum, I almost feel a computer breaking down trying to run it. From what I can see it's a fair bit better on other platforms like the C64, but as this shows, well, the Micros did have a strange background role in the story of one of the most iconic games and greatest ports ever. Hell, it looks more faithful to the arcade game than Mike Tyson's Punch-Out does. But, but does it play as well? <laughs> and no. No, it doesn't. Okay, that's enough beating things up for a while. Let's get on the road. Up next is something that usually resulted in damn good ports. Chase HQ. Ocean knocked it out of the park with this one, didn't they? It's a perfectly good arcade game, but on the spectrum, for that platform, it's an absolute cracker. Fast enough, bashy enough, great play. And that's not all. It kicks absolute ass on the Amstrad too. It's not like the specy version as you'd expect, only with way more colour. These games are awesome, and Ocean clearly did a ban-up job converting this game to the 8-bit micros. Well, almost. There's one platform I didn't mention. You might wonder what Chase HQ on the C64 is like. Considering how good it is on Specky and CPC, you might expect great fins. Well, guess what? You are not going to get them. It turns out that, alas, Ocean screwed Chase HQ up on the C64 almost as much as they nailed it on the other micros. The gameplay somehow is choppier than it is on the other systems, a definite achievement considering the C64 actually has hardware for this sort of thing. The colours? Barely even there, seems like half the game's in monochrome. The sound? Annoying, an engine note that's actually painful to listen to. Jeez, basically they really managed to bugger up this one. It feels kind of like a direct port of the Amstrad version perhaps, only whoever did it managed to utterly cripple it, and that's not usually something you would say. You might be wondering, how? How do you make such a good conversion for other systems, and then such a dreadful one here? It's hard to say exactly why, but one can speculate. By the time this came out in 1989, the C64, a platform which Ocean was damn good on at one point, kinda had become an afterthought. They still had a strong presence on the Specky and on the Amstrad, but not so much on the C64. Perhaps most of their 64 guys had switched over to the Amiga by this point, leaving the system in a temporary lurch with the end result being total duds like Chase HQ here. That's just speculation, but it wouldn't be a surprise. And it wouldn't be fair not to mention that Ocean did sort of make amends with a pretty cracking port of Chase HQ 2 on the 64 that righted a lot of wants, even if that was kinda down to a renewed 64 push in support of the utterly doomed and haplessly hopeless C64 game system. But anywho, yeah, this is one hell of a disappointing damp squib of what, on other platforms, is an utterly iconic port. Unlike Chase HQ, which did at least have some pretty awesome ports, Sega's out one… yeah. It's fair to say that US Gold did this game dirty, with some pretty miserable ports across the board. Amiga? Crap. Atari ST? Utter crap. ZX Spectrum? Beyond crap. C64? Eh, actually not too crap. Still kinda crap. You just can't get a decent out one on computers, it seems. But as slow, choppy and lacking as all of these efforts were, they saved their absolute worst for the Amstrad CPC version, a Hall of Shame level port that's so dreadful it would have been less of an insult to Amstrad owners if they'd just dumped a steaming turd in a box and sold that instead. The title screen is much the same as most of the other US Gold versions, complete with music. Now I wouldn't normally point that out, but you might want to listen to this version of Splashway for a bit, as it's the only music in the whole game. Yeah, this version of Outrun has no in-game music. In fact, it has barely any sound at all, aside from a pathetic attempt at skidding. Other than that, it's deadly silence. The game did come packaged with an extra music cassette, mind you, which could help assuming that you had your hi-fi close to your computer. Considering how important the music is to play in Out1, we are already on quite the loser here, aren't we? And the game itself runs at a frame rate that is very comfortably in the single digits. 
Even the awful ZX Spectrum version runs faster than this, and that actually had music. Pour out one. Pour, pour out one. Just... What did they do to you? This port, seriously, is an absolute disgrace. If I'd made it, I'd still be utterly ashamed of it even now. Just pathetic. Next up, we have two efforts from the ZX Spectrum library that I have actually looked at before, but that was years ago, and I feel justified in bringing them up once more for this video, for a bigger audience than I had back then. And so here's Stun Runner from Domark, released in around about 1990. This, well, it definitely takes some balls. Atari's Stun Runner, at the time of its release, was a fully 3D, ultra fast arcade, perhaps the most advanced one available at the time. You couldn't play an even close to accurate version of this game at home until the PlayStation 2 era. And, well, here it is on the ZX Spectrum. In order to try and claim that you're bringing this game successfully to people's homes on this machine, yeah, you're gonna need some connets for that. The result is kind of as you would expect. As it goes, I do think DeMarc tried, but bringing this tunnel race at home? It just wasn't going to happen, at all. There are points where the game does actually manage to give the illusion of impressive speed, mainly the outdoor sections. But the tunnels? It's a weird, choppy, crap kaleidoscope. Something that should probably come with an epilepsy warning. And it's just not a game that translates well to the home at all. This is a game that's kind of like a technical demo, and there's not exactly much there to work with. Here on the ZX Spectrum, well, there's even less. A minute in, you've pretty much seen everything there is to see, three minutes in, you'll be bored as hell, and five minutes in, you'll be turning it off. That'll be ten pounds, please. You'd be especially pissed off if you'd seen the previews for the game in magazines, and perhaps been wowed at the screenshots there, cause hey, just look at the colours! Those colours weren't in the final version, I'm afraid. Some have wondered if there's a second version of this port out there, but I think it's much more likely that these are mock-up screens, an all too common practice in those days. Either way, you really just have to wonder what on earth the point was of even trying to convert this game to the specy. It was never, ever going to happen. And well, I really couldn't let this video go out without a mention of Kung Fu Master on the Spectrum, another very special job indeed from US Gold. Unlike our last entry, Kung Fu Master, or Spartan X if you're Japanese, is a pretty simple game from 1984. You walk in a certain direction, and you punch and kick anything that's in your way. Not exactly cutting edge, even at the time it was released, but fun as hell. A year later, in 1985, a team working for Birmingham's Golden Boys put out a version of IRM's classic for the Specky, And this was the result. That opening blast of music is a good sign of what's to come, being one of the most unlistenable fins ever to be eked out from the 48k beeper. And then the game itself is a real shocker. It's so slow. Our boy Thomas hobbles forward as if he's broken a leg or two in his time. Not of other people, but his own. Enemies do much the same, the music continues to irritate, the flicker is ridiculous, especially when you jump in front of those windows, and if an enemy happens to get close to you, all they do is, uh, hug you to death. It's like they're bouncers holding you back. Thomas is trying to get into a nightclub. You most certainly will not want to play this beyond a single go. Afterwards, you'll turn it off and wonder how such a simple game was screwed up so badly. Even with horizontal games on the specy often being flicked screen due to the system's limitations, and with the likelihood of not having a Joffa Smith-like genius on board to circumvent that, this still could have been a hell of a lot better. The end result is just hideously ugly and dull. When games like this come out, it's no wonder that companies like Canvas tended to figure that big companies like US Gold or Ocean weren't necessarily making sure all the games released under their name were of decent quality, and thus they could put out any old garbage. I can think of very few ports from the arcade to the Spectrum that are worse than this one. Honestly. Dreadful. 
Finally, we're going to end with two ports from consoles to the Amiga, including one that I have been waiting patiently to stick into a video for… years. But before that, we've got one of my Mega Drive favourites, Alien 3. You probably already know that I love this licensed game, with its brilliant Matt Furness soundtrack, intense atmosphere and xenomorphs lurking around every corner. It's not exactly like the film, but it's damn good. And surprisingly it came out on the Amiga too. And I mean it's not terrible, but again like so many of these ports, it could be a lot better. It kinda shows that Alien 3 is a rather delicate mix, if you get rid of one thing, you kinda screw the whole lot up. Here Alien 3 is ruined by the need to either choose between music or sound effects, something that was often the case with Amiga games. If you have only SFX, well you're missing out on the brilliant soundtrack, which adds so much to the game and without it actually makes it all a bit boring. If you have only music, you get the soundtrack, and Matt Furness's work still sounds pretty good on the Amiga, but you really need SFX for this game. It helps you to figure out when a xenomorphs come out of the ground, especially as you only get seconds to react most of the time. Removing one of these fins completely spoils the experience. Other fins spoil it a bit too. Everything's a bit clunkier, and the controls are way slower and less responsive, which sure doesn't help a game that again relies on reacting very quickly to the sudden presence of enemies. And well, there's just a certain lack of care. Take this hidden passage here. If no one cared enough to so much as mask out Ripley's sprite, I don't see a lot of reason to care about this port. I guess this probably wouldn't be a bad game if I hadn't already played and loved the Mega Drive version so much, but considering the quality of some ports from MD to Amiga, this is disappointing. Still, I now know that it exists, which must count for something in this life I suppose. And finally, at long last, Ninja Gaiden. You might not think that to be obscure, there were lots of ports of Ninja Gaiden after all, particularly on the micros. And they were all rubbish. But then they were ports of an already rubbish game, the original arcade beat em up is total crap, and if anything a bunch of the micro ports actually improved on it. But no, I have something else. Ninja Gaiden would have been doomed to obscurity if not, of course, for Tecmo's NES version. Forget the shitty beat em up, do something different and become the last, glorious word in ultra fast, super hard, absolutely staggering NES 8 bit action. Create an unadulterated masterpiece, and then afterwards create two more. Well, so long as you play the Japanese version of Ninja Gaiden 3 anyway. And here's where we get something special. On the Amiga, there exists support of, of all things, Ninja Gaiden 2 The Dark Sword of Chaos. Nothing to do with the cruddy beat em up, this is a port of the NES game. Odd considering that there wasn't an Amiga port of the NES Ninja Gaiden. This just seems to have come out of nowhere. You can thank the American publishers Game Tech for this. I did have a look at this a long while back for my good friend on the Sticks Same Name Different Game series, which you should definitely check out, but now, at long last, it's right here on the mothership, daddy. So what to say about this complete oddity? Ryu Hayabusa, for whatever reason, isn't a blue ninja anymore, he's now a red one. But other than that he can still run and jump and do all the things, just not in a way you would expect. Game Tech and the folks who developed this obviously didn't like having to use up to jump in most Amiga games, so they tried something else. You press the button to jump, and you hold up and right on the joystick to attack. You do not use the button to attack at all. This is, as you might expect, unbelievably weird. It goes against literally everything. An absolute heretic. It is nice to have an actual jump button, especially in a game like this that's filled with intricate jumps, but well the attacking's a complete shitshow as you would expect. I presume that this was hardly an ideal solution for game tech, and that they just wished that more Amiga owners had a stick with a bloody second button on it. The game doesn't ever stop being weird, really. Like most of the fins are there from the NES game, including the cutscenes, but it's all so odd. This game doesn't really convert any of the original sprites, it redoes them in a very crude way. It feels like a child's bad drawing of Ninja Gaiden. And the music? Ugh, lord. The music is wretched. 
perhaps some of the worst I've heard on the Amiga. It tries to recreate the original soundtrack, but God knows why they choose these instruments. And yeah, it's very choppy. In the end, well, you have something quite terrible indeed. I almost don't want to bash it too hard, however. I actually think, despite the very low quality of the port, the people behind this probably really loved a Ninja Gaiden. You'd kinda have to, to be American and port this game, of all games, to what was then kind of a dead platform in the United States. But the execution is seriously lacking. It's certainly not like any action game I've ever played before or since, although hardly in a good way. And well, that's it. Hopefully you've enjoyed this little look at some rather obscure microcomputer ports. Needless to say, I'm sure there's plenty more out there that are waiting to be rediscovered and dragged up in such a way, and I'm sure that's something you'll mention in your delicious comments. Certainly that'll give me more ammunition for another video in this vein further down the line. But for now, hopefully you've enjoyed this one, and as ever I shall say, bye for now! If you like this video then hey, please do like it, have a look at my social media, and perhaps also have a look at my Patreon. Perhaps you could join this lovely list of people right here. Alexa Jones-Gonzalez, Andrew Dalton, Andy Catt, Asobi Quan DX, Brian Henniger, Chris, Cody Spooner, Conrad Pritchard, D. Xalior Rimwan Sutter, Dave Cork, David Rose, Dinty76538, Dustin Cooper, Gary Samaden, Geordie Alex, Glunfeth, Ian Roberts, James Brown, Jason Stevens, Jace Alexander, Jeff Ladd, Lucas Kaligoski, Matthias Granzov, Martin Pataki, Potter Margell, Ren Bimon, Rusty Kelly, Samir Alamar, Seth Robinson, Simon Gulliver, Tariq Amir, The Geeky Dad, Tim Wald, Yucca Operator, and all the rest of the community, thank you so much, and goodbye.